it's a sixth generation Chinese American with roots in America going back to the gold rush. And he's president of a organization called Generations LLC in the creative realm. And he's uh, writes stories, poems, uh, lyrics, and makes films. So that's why I'm saying he's a Renaissance person as well as being a genealogist. Um, and he has a, a lot of works, including Hyuni Amor, Sultry Ecstasy and Frosty Agony, a poetry book, Chop Suey and Sushi from Sea to Shining Sea, uh, which I'll show you at the end. Uh, Canto Cutie Poems, Village of Dragon Hill, and My Odyssey Between Two Worlds. He's written journal articles uh, for the Chinese Historical Society of America and Chinese Historical Society of Southern California, and he's staff writer for AJAM News and Asian American News Company. So as you can see, I, I totally wonder how Raymond does all these things and when he has time to sleep. So without further ado, uh, Raymond Chong. Well, thank you, Mr. Grant. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present to the California Geological Society. And this is a story that extends 173 years of my family in America, Go Mountain. And what I will share with you is the journey of my great, great grandfather, Bun Yun Chung, a Chinese railroad worker. So this is the odyssey, my odyssey in ge genealogy. It started on January 30th, 2003, 19 years ago. On that day in Monterey, on a Thursday afternoon, on January 30th, 2003, John Thomas Killip was in his bathtub, took a handgun and shot himself. Suicide. Before the, his suicide, I was pursuing my American dream of riches, success, marriage, career, things of that nature. After his suicide, I went into more of a inner journey of my roots between America and China. Before that, January 30th, 2003, I knew absolutely nothing about my Chinese roots other than I knew I like to eat Chinese food. My roots, are from in Hoi Ping, in Guangdong, in China, in the famous Pearl River Delta, in the four counties called Seya. In particular, one county, Hoi Ping, along the Tanjing River on the South Bank, near Hong Kong, near Canton, Macau. Here, that is my roots. And for some reason, my family, my father, my grandfather, never talk about their roots in China. He was a dark secret in my family. This is Yunlongong, the village of Dragon Hill in Hoi Ping. And you can see, you see the mountains, the rice fields, the fish pond, the castles. You see my house on the sixth row, the ninth house. That is my house, my ancestor home. This is my paradise in Hoi Ping, in China. And from Yulongong village are the sojourners, the pioneers from Hoi Ping, from China to Cathay, to America, known as Go Mountain or Gum Sum. Five generations of sojourners and pioneers. And this is generations, seven generations on Goa Mountain, starting from 1849 to now, 173 years, starting with my great, great, great grandfather, Shan Chen Zheng, generation one. My great, great grandfather, generation two, Bun Yun Cheng. Third generation, Hoi Leng Cheng. Fourth generation, Moi Cheng. 
fifth generation, Jim Sui Chong, my father. Then myself, generation six, my brother. And continuing our family saga on Go Mountain, Kinji Kyle Chong, generation seven. This is our extension, our family for 173 years. And generation one, how did he come to Go Mountain? That's my great, great, great grandfather, Chen Chen Zheng. He came here for, before that, it was the start of the 1839 to 1949 in China, the century of humiliation. And my great, great, great grandfather came to America because of the California girl rush in 1849. He came among the thousands from the East Coast, from other parts of the world, from Latin America, from China to go to Go Mountain to the first city, San Francisco in 1849. And they were panning for goals in the gold fields from the Sierra Nevada up to the Northern California to look for the specks of gold in the river waters of California among the thousands of Americans and Europeans and nations. And they arrived on clipper boats, clipper ships from Hong Kong over a month to San Francisco, Port of San Francisco, the first city. And that included my great, great, great grandfather. And among the others he mined for gold, from roughly 1849 to 1855. So he went back to Hoi Ping, to Yulongong village, and raise his son, my great great grandfather, Bun Yun Chung, generation two. And during that time, China was in the midst of chaos. There were civil war between clans, in particular in Kat, in uh, Guangdong, the Punta, the Hakka clan wars, or a million people died from 1855 to 1865. So there's a lot of turmoil. There's also floods, starvation, uh, war, uh, warfare, crime, things of that nature during that time. So he arrived around 1865 to the first city, the port of San Francisco, to, to part in the first Transcontinental Railroad from 1865 to 1869. My great great grandfather was part of the Army of Canton to build the Iron Road from 1865 to 1869. And the Central Pacific Railroad was the driving force. The company led by the big four, Leland Stanford, of course, Stanford University, Carlos Porter Huntington, Huntington Library. Charles Crocker, Crocker Bank, Mark Hopkins, the Hopkins Hotel in San Francisco. These were the driving force, the big four, Stanford, Huntington, Crocker, Hopkins. And their dream was to build the Iron Road to connect the East with the West from San Francisco, then from Sacramento, tying into meeting from the east, from the Union Pacific Railroad, from Council Bluff to Omaha, to the point near Salt Lake in Utah, Utah Territory. So that was their objective, to build the Iron Road. And this is the profile showing what the Iron Road, from the flatlands of Sacramento up to the summit or the Sierra Nevada down to the Great Basin towards Promontory Summit, 690 miles. It was a tough journey to get 
to succumb the Sierra Nevada to reach to Pomeranian summit. And this is the kind of the geeky part. I'm an engineer. So this is the details is the tracks four foot eight and a half inches wide, the ballast 12 to four inches in depth, stone and gravel, iron rail, the type of the ties, they had to put roughly 2,260 to 2,640 ties per mile. That's hardship work. But it was the army of Canton, 12,000 strong Chinese, in particular from Hoi Ping, Toi San, Yinping, Yinping, to build the Iron Road for the Central Pacific Railroad. That was the Army of Canton. And part of their work was the Donner Flat, I mean, the Dutch Flat, the Donner Lake Wagon Road, a, actually a towed franchise, 90 miles long between Dutch Flat to Truckee River, built from fall 1862 to July 14, excuse me, 1864, that's a typo, 1864. And from there, we had to cut stone called a former cut east of Sacramento, 800 feet long, 65 feet deep. That oh, took a year to get a cutting and chipping away from our cut. And they had to build a bridge across the American River over 400 feet long. This is a picture of that American River Bridge at that time. And they had to build a ledge to, to carry the train that was 1,322 feet above the American River. That took roughly a year from summer of 1865 to the spring of 1866. You can see the work, the hammering, the chipping away to build that rocky ledge to carry a train. The summit tunnels, an awesome treatment over the Sierra Nevada at elevation 7,025 feet to build 15 tunnels across solid granite. 15 tunnels. And tunnel number six, the longest one, the most deepest one was 1,659 feet long and 125 feet deep. Tunnel number six. It took roughly two years to punch through all the tunnels, the 15 tunnels, from fall of 1865 to November 30th, 1867. That took a lot of tenacity, hardship, sacrifice, struggle to achieve that, those 15 tunnels. From there, drop down to the Great Basin of Nevada, Utah, endless flatlands to build the iron road across the desert, the high desert of Nevada and Utah. And one singular achievement was the building of the tracks, 10 miles of tracks in a single day on April 28th, 1869. Prior to that event, the Union Pacific crew had built six miles of their own track, but Crocker wanted to beat Union Pacific and he did that with 10 miles of a single track on April 28th, 1869. And of course, he finally met at Palmer Tarmy Summit in Utah near the Great Salt Lake on May 10th, 1869. And everyone knows of this famous picture. And I believe there's an image of a Chinese railroad worker. His back is behind us, but I believe there is a Chinese railroad worker in that picture right there. And it was the day of the Golden Spike where the Central Pacific Jupiter number 60 
met the Union Pacific number 119. The Iron Horses met. And I believe it was Stafford who put the hammer and nail they're going to spike on that day, May 10th, 1869. And what it did was one hand for Southern Pacific Railroad to start service from Sacramento to Palmetto Summit. And from there, you had to switch off to go on a Union Pacific train from Sacramento to Palmetto Summit it took one day and 15 and a quarter hours, a fare of $50, and you get two bags for free, like Southwest Airlines, 100 pounds per person. That was, that was the typical ride on May 17, 1869. And this is the, the path between S San Francisco to Sacramento to Palmetto Summit to Omaha. This is the first Transcontinental Railroad. And at the time, they call it the Overland Route. For myself, my connection is my family roots in Hoi Ping at Yulongong Village. On May 8th, 2009, I pay honor to my ancestors. Five generation, including Chung Sen Jung, the gold miner, and Wun Yun Chung, a Chinese railroad worker. This is a form of honoring our ancestors. In that tomb, in that particular grounds, are five generations of my ancestors. And this is the tomb of Bunyan Chung on, on some hill, Hill of the Flying Swan. That is the final burial ground of my great, great grandfather. After the day of the golden spike, he returned to his wife. He built his gold mountain house in the village with his gold pieces or golden eagles. The genealogy aspect of my family roots. Well, here's some, some, some background. Because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, there were plenty of Chinese immigration files uh, from my ancestors. There was a federal mandate to document after 1882, any Chinese immigrants, whether you're a citizen or not. There, it was, there was very thorough coverage of the men and women. There were restrictions of immigration, uh, limitations of women to arrive in Gold Mountain, America. To your left is an application for to, to immigrate to America. And that's my father. Look at, you see in that picture and his paper father, his, his uncle, who pretend to be his father to immigrate in 1932. To your right is the certificate of identity of my father. And the Chinese immigration files has records of the interviews, the interrogation of the federal immigration officials by, by my father, who told his, the story of the village in Hoi Ping, his version of his life in Yalongong prior to arriving in Go Mountain in 1932. Another path of my genealogy path is what we call Zhu Pu, a family tree in of my village that dates back from now to 1506 AD. This is the family tree of my village, Yilong Gong, from 1506 to now. Roughly 45 generations are documented in this book. And from my research, I explore my roots. I found this one, a feng shui, a certain 
cultural vision why there's a village. There's the ancient forest, the temple, and the rice fields that is to, uh, connected to the Basha River. So this is my village, the symmetry, the cultural relationship, the geography. And here is the layout of my village, uh, Yonalongong village, showing the ancestor hall, the memorial hall, the basketball court, the dwellings, the Dai La, the castle in the sky, the Feng Shui pagoda, the gates. And of course, it shows my house. The, the, the sixth the, the house, the ninth house on the sixth row is there. That, this is the layout of my village in Yongong, in Hoiping. But the, the fascinating discovery was my tale, our story told by my, my aunt, Zhang Zhou Hao. On that day, on January 1st, 2013, she told me a story of my great, great grandfather, Bun Yun Cheng. She mentioned to me, he lived that he lived in a, in a city that was always moving every day. When she mentioned that, I realized she meant he was moving from camp to camp along the Iron Road the first trunk on the railroad. And that reaffirmed the connection of Bun Yun Cheng as being the Chinese railroad worker. And I had a professor from Yu, Wu Yu University from Jungmen, Dr. Jin Han Tan, Sila, who explored my village, did a case study, and this is her, her research, my village at that time, around 2015. And this is what I call the hot Hoi Ping Dai La, castles in the, in the sky, which are the UNESCO World Heritage Site. And these were used as, as watchtowers and as, as, as homes at that time in, in my village. This is the Zan clan ancestor hall showing the inside the portraits of our founders of the, of the village in 1506. This is our ancestor hall. This is our recreational hall in the village in Hoiping, Yunlongong village. And this is the Go Mountain house of Hoi Ling Chung, Bun Yun Chung's son. Um, Bun Yun Cheng, when he returned back to the village, he built his gold mountain house. But over time, he went derelict and deteriorated. So it got demolished. But this is the other gold mountain house built by my great grandfather that's still standing in the village. Another path was for me to hire a company called My China Roots in Beijing, China. And they did extensive research. I interview my, my elders, the villagers. They studied the gazettes that recorded the history of Hoi Ping from 1506 to now. Very extensive, confirming the, the stories, the legends, the tales. And they were able to go far back to my Zhang clan back. 158 generations to Hong Di, the Yellow Emperor. 158 generations to Yellow Emperor of 2010 BC. So I have a family tree that extends from now back to 2007, 10, 8 BC, 158 generations. At the same time, I created a website with my China roots that tells the story of my, my roots, both in China and America. I have the Chronicles that tells a story from roughly 600 AD to fast forward to now. I have my ancestor line from there covering that. 
thanks to my my uh, partnership with my China Roots in Beijing. At the same time, from in the creative realm, I I developed a film, My Odyssey Between Two Rows, a documentary with the connection between America and China in my return to my village, Yulongong, and the path of my, my forefathers, starting with, with my great, great, great grandfather to now. This is the documentary, My Odyssey Between Two Worlds. I also wrote a, a journal article, or actually an encyclopedia article on the Transcontinental Railroad myself. So I, in, in a little irony, I wrote a little history for an encyclopedia of my ancestors on the Transcontinental Railroad. But most importantly, three years ago, May 10th, 2019, the Chinese railroad workers were finally recognized for their contribution for the first Transcontinental Railroad, uh, led by Connie Young Yu. 150 years later, and I was there on May 10th, 2019, to represent my great great grandfather. Hey, and to my right, there's Grant Din. You're right there, Grant. I see you right there too. So here's the connection. There's a whole war for a relationship right there in that picture. I want to continue the story of the Chong clan, the Zhang clan on Go Mountain. And this is the timeline that extends from 1849 to now. The key events, milestones of my family, my forefathers in Go Mountain in America. And to the left are the different impacts, the Page Act, the Chinese Conclusion Act, the Chinese Civil War, World War II, the Japanese Chinese War, all to the left. These were the external factors that drive, were the, driving our lives, both in China and in America. So this covers roughly 173 years of our history on Go Mountain, this timeline. And we were adversely impacted by the discrimination, by the hatred, by the Chinese Inclusion Act, in particular, 1882, with the anti-Chinese sentiment where we had to be, document ourselves, had our, our Chinese immigration file. We were always the um, unwelcome foreigner on Gong Mountain. This is the legacy that, that we had to bear on Gong Mountain, unwanted, unrespected. Hoi Ling Chung, generation three. My great grandfather, he lived in Boston Chinatown from 1891 to 1926. He is that gentleman to your right next to my father, roughly 1924. He was a successful entrepreneur because he found success in gambling and opium. Very successful, he got plenty of go egos. He was a successful entrepreneur. He invested in many businesses across the New England and even on the West Coast in San Francisco, Chinatown. That is my, the legacy of Hoi Ling Chun, who also moved back in 1926 to be with his wife and became the mayor of the Young Longguang village back then. Generation four, Moi Chung, who arrived in 1912 at the first city, Port of San Francisco. As on a student visa, he eventually became a merchant with this company called Chongqing Company at 658 Grand Avenue for a time. So at six, 656 Grand Avenue, no, yeah, 658 Grand Avenue, or at, before that, it was known as DuPont Street. That's my, my grandfather, Moi Chung. 
Later on, from 1923 to 1936, he was a owner of a fine first class chop suey restaurant called the Imperial Restaurant at Central Square, at two Central Square. It was near Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Harvard University. So he did really good business up through the Great Depression. This is the Imperial Restaurant. You see the sign, it says chop suey. And you know what chop suey is? Chop suey is an American version of Cantonese cuisine. And from the late 19th century to 1965, chop suey was the predominant cuisine of Chinese food across America in downtown, where you see signs, neon signs that says chop suey. And chop suey was the main dish for people to enjoy Chinese food. But because of the circumstance of the Chinese Exclusion Act, my grandmother and my grandfather were separated from 1923 to 1966, a long last love. They were separated when my grandfather left back to Boston in 1923. And then my grandmother was a young mother with my father. And I didn't realize until years later, they were separated for 43 years until they were reunited at the Los Angeles International Airport in Cern Arnie on February 14th, 1966, after 40 years of separation. Generation five, Jim Sui Chong, the paper son, my father, who arrived as a sojourner, or excuse me, as a pioneer in 1932 at Boston, at the East Boston Immigration Station. Then eventually with my grandfather, Moi Chung, moved from Cambridge to Little Tokyo in Los Angeles. Little Tokyo is the, the community of the Nikkei of the Southland. And they stayed at their cousin's restaurant, the Nikolo Chapsuri. And you see this picture to the left. On top is the, the Nicolo Chop Suey House. That's where they stayed in Little Tokyo from 1936 to 1943. After my father graduated from Belmont High School in 19, early 1941, World War II occurred after Pearl Harbor. My father went and to be a to be trained to be an aircraft mechanic at the Curtis Wright Technical Institute in Glendale in California. From there, he signed up and enlisted in the Naval Reserve, but also signed up to work for the Pan American Airways from 1943 to 1945. And especially was to serve the seaplanes, the flying boats. And in particular, the most famous one, the China Clipper that was, was known for the first Trans-Pacific airmail service in 1935. And this picture is rather significant. You see the 11 Chinese Americans, and that's my father there, um, the, uh, knee, kneeling down and to the third to, to, from the left, um, the gentleman with the cap, his name is Li Liang, the crew chief. That picture was taken in 1943. Six years later, at a party, I met Li Liang, the crew chief. Six years later. Another and significance of this picture, you see the young guy, second to the right with the slick hair, he eventually became a, a Korean War jet fighter pilot. Roland Chin Wan. Fast forward, I met him roughly in 2018. So this is a significant picture right there. And you see the, the, the big guy with the big shoulders, 
tall guy, little history. He was a halfback for the University of California at Berkeley for a couple of years. So this picture has a lot of symbolism right there. Well, another interesting aspect of my father after the end of World War II, he had a lot of savings. And this was, he was in San Francisco, Chinatown, and he put his money into a place called to a Kubicon Theater restaurant from 1946 to 1950. This was the day, the, the, the golden age of the China nightclub, where it was this particular place at 414 Grand Avenue at the gateway of San Francisco Chinatown at Bush and Grant on the second floor, three times a night. Eddie Pond, the main owner, had three programs of shows. He had hard drinks. He had a lavish dinner of chop suey and the finest American dishes of steak. You would have dancing to the jazzy Latino sounds. Then you would cap it with a awesome program of comedy, singing, and stripping. So in my mind, those were the glory days for my father in 1946 to 1950, during the golden age of the Chinese nightclub. Later on, my father, Jim Sui Chong, went back to Los Angeles, to Los Angeles Chinatown, and he worked at Little Tokyo for my, my cousin's restaurant known for his chop suey. As you can see, this chop suey, again, from 1935 to 1992, the Far East Cafe served the Nikkei community of the Southland. My father was a waiter, weekend waiter from 1950 to 1974. And you can see to the left is, is this iconic chop suey sign. And to the right, is uh, me and my, my, my younger brother, Michael. And this was a time of joy getting close to his clan, his cousin from Hoi Ping. For myself, generation six, my creative madness, I, as I mentioned, written, written journal articles. This is the first one I wrote about my father, Jim Sui Chong for the Gumsum Journal. Later on, I wrote lyrics for my album, Village of Dragon Hill. That is my creative realm of uh, pursuit. And soon in poetry, I'll be uh, releasing my, my new book, Peonia Amor, Sultry Ecstasy and Frosty Agony. That's coming up this spring. And I'm co-edited a book called Chop Suey and Sushi from Sea to Shining Sea, Chinese and Japanese restaurants in the United States with Bruce Makaro Arno and Tanford M. N. Tech. In generation seven, Kinji Kyo Chang, my number one son, my only son, and who's now a filmmaker at Hollywood, based out from Austin to represent our family story. He's also involved with a uh, musician, a singer named Kishi, um, making videos, uh, photography with um, Island Records. Hopefully he'll do a European tour uh, like North American tour, Asian tour, sometimes starting in spring of this year. So this is a legacy uh, what I discovered over the time in my past 19 years from 2003 to now. And the legacy is relating, thankful for my forefathers in particular um, I, we have a permanent exhibit that reflects Wenyin Chung, my great great grandfather, the Chinese railroad worker, that acknowledged us, my son and me, 
as his descendants that's recognized at the California State Railroad Museum, at the California Railroad Workers Experience. We're recognized for that. And for more research, more opportunities, my China roots, if you want to dig into your roots in China, they're a fabulous resource. Um, interviews, oral stories, Zilpu, family trees, fabulous. And they have a fantastic database of all the family trees in China, all electronically scanned and all, all linked together. So this is, Mr. Grant, my genealogy story from 1849 to now, 173 years between America and China. Mr. Grant. Thank you, Dr. Raymond. Um, actually, if you could turn off your sharing for a sec, it will give you, we'll give Raymond a break to uh, get settled for a sec while we have a couple words from our sponsor, uh, <laughs> which is the uh, California Genealogical Society has a number of events coming up. In fact, next week, uh, if you look in the chat, there are links to our programs. Uh, we have a California um, research uh, series and it's really exciting um, next week at the same time we're actually at 4 p.m is the california state archives uh, the following week is special collections at the sacramento public library and i think among the archives there might be some railroad documents and, and a brand new program that we haven't um, got a registration for yet but april 26 the california historical society will um, francis kaplan will present some of the uh, great photographs they have on file. They have a, a lot of uh, great resources and probably some of the um, Kublai Khan and, and Far East, uh, Raymond, I, I wouldn't be surprised because they have a lot of great shots of San Francisco, Chinatown, LA and elsewhere. And the Chinatown ones are divided by street. So if you know of an uh, address that your ancestors might be on, you can look on there. And another announcement is that the um, we've been telling everyone that the National Genealogical Society is having its annual conference in Sacramento this year. That's the first time in, uh, I think, think since 2019 that they'll have an in-person conference. Um, we hope that um, COVID will not come back and that we can really have it in person. We're, we're gearing up that hundreds of people have registered already. So you can click on that link to find out more. And uh, if you want to learn more about the railroads, uh, Gordon H. Chang from Stanford will give the keynote address on the 25th. And there will be numerous tours. I'm leading one of the gold country. And, and then I also have a, a, a talk on Angel Island and also um, something about Chinese railroad worker files. And so that will be coming up in May. And um, I know we have a couple questions in the chat, but I'll start off with one for um, Raymond and just wonder if you could let us know um, how you found out about your railroad ancestor. Was it family uh, oral history that you heard about or um, any documents left behind? I'm always curious because I know I haven't found anything from my yes. ancestor and, and I, I, I didn't know Raymond back in Utah, so I would have said hello back. No, I, thought you were the <laughs> I know, same picture. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, that's real life. Looking at that picture. Um, here was a, a grant, uh, our story told by my aunt on January 1st, 2013, but I had it validated by Sheila Tan. You, you know her, Sheila. Mm -hmm. And she did went into the village and talked, interviewed the elders uh, on the spot where he had built his, uh, his, his um, Gold Mountain house in, 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 at that time. So that was validated. Mm. And then, and then uh, My China Roots, again, did a, a secondary uh, confirmation of, 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 um, of um, Bunyan Chung, uh, his, his legacy. So wow. I, That's I, great uh, that Celia could do that. I mean, hundred year, over 150 years later, you could get that information. That's amazing. Yes, I mean, she did as a, as a special project because she was okay. connected with Dr. Gordon Chang too with that, the project. So it, it, all, it tied together. Uh -huh. Well, that's great. Okay. Lisa, are there um, any questions that you can ask? Well, 
Yeah, there was one uh, at the very beginning. Uh, Crystal said you had great handouts and she wanted to know how you made that lovely timeline. It's called software called CorelDRAW. And it's, it's been a work in progress. Being, being the creative side is um, with my brother, because you look at the context of that particular timeline, it has Chinese symbolism too. The, the, the animal years in there. Yeah, yeah. It was subtle that ties to my Chinese roots. So it took a little effort, but um, it's, don't thank me, thank my brother for the creating that particular timeline. <laughs> That's great that uh, you have a brother who's helpful for, for you to do that. Um, yeah. and, and the reason why I did the two tier timeline is, okay, we have our history, our milestone of our life, but there's so many external impacts where it's war or legislation. Yeah. And that gives you a little more context of our lives in, in America. Well, it's an excellent example. We all should be figuring out what the context of what's happening in the world, in the local areas where our people lived because our, our ancestors didn't live in isolation. So uh, Phil said that Dutch Flat Road became in 1913, a portion of the Lincoln Highway, the America's first coast to coast um, automobile route. So you were talking about the Dutch Flat area where they were working. Um, so that's pretty cool. And then I see Grant put in a bunch of things. Um, how, uh, Douglas asks, how did Sheila confirm that your ancestor was a railroad construction worker? By visiting the village? Yes. Actually, uh, Sheila has visited my village many times. Um, we've done some projects. Um, I did the mapping. You know, everything is by our stories. There's no way called physical letters. And I know Gordon Chang was pursuing for the, all those letters, but it was all our stories, uh, the presence of, of, of the where the old house was located, but there's no white call uh, legacy letters or anything of that nature. Okay. Um, so do you, do you have any idea what the, uh, the workers expected uh, once they got here to work on the railroad? I mean, you know, they knew they were coming to do that. Did, did they have any idea what they were expecting to do? Well, the way it was arranged was it, they were hired by contractors in Hong Kong or in Guangdong, and they were recruited and they were told, you can make some good money. You, you, you pay for your shipping. We get, you get there, you'll be successful. And then when you come back, you, you bring your golden egos. And um, that was the temptation because people were very desperate. The, the famine, the wars, the, the criminal activity. Things were very bleak. It was bare. Bunyan Chung, the way he survived was to pick up wood off, off the ground for firewood. That was his means of living. Um, starvation was, was a driving force. Mm -hmm. Poverty was everywhere. And they heard the tales of Gold Mountain, the land of riches. Same thing like Canada, like Australia. They heard stories of riches across the ocean. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see, where did you find some of your great historical non-family pictures? So you illustrated your um, talk very nicely with these other um, photos besides those of your family. Well, uh, for example, the, the Stanford University with the Chinese railroad worker exhibit, they have a, a archives of fantastic photography and I, I call it a, a stir, 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 stereophonic photos like back, back then. So that's where I got those photos. Uh, you can get a lot of photos in the archives at the Library of Congress too. Mm -hmm. Think back to the ninth century, there's a huge stockpile of some of the most famous photographers that are kept at the Library of Congress in particular. And of course, there's many museums all across the country uh, that have their archives. Um, right now, I'm writing the story of the second Trent Railroad from San Francisco through Lathrop 
to Los Angeles, to, to Yuma, to Tucson, to El Paso, to New Orleans from 1869 to 1883. So I'm writing that story. I'm getting archival photos from different museums, getting the, the respective fees to pay, pay for to allow me to publish that, that, that article. Oh, that's great. So, I'm working on that different story. Uh, and and the, the, the thing about the Chinese railroad worker, where we were everywhere after this, we were, we were building the railroads from the west coast to the east coast, the south and the north. We were everywhere. Well, they, they got the experience, that's for sure. Yes. Uh, Marion asks, what law changed in 1966 that allowed your parents uh, or grandparents to re reunite? Can you repeat that, repeat that question, Lisa? I, I guess your grandparents reunited in 1966. What, yes. what caused them to do that? Was there a law change? Well, a little history, context, the Page Act in 1875, Congress saw, felt that most Chinese women were prostitutes. So they were not the right kind of woman to immigrate to America. So there was limited restrictions. It created the, we call it the so-called Baptist Society. So for every 10 Chinese men in America, there's maybe one woman. It was very restricted. Um, even though my grandfather was a merchant, I don't know the exact reason other than I know that they were separated for, from 1923 to 1966. And for me as a kid, I was 10 years old, living in Los Angeles in a place called Frog Town. Elysian Valley near the Los Angeles River. I'm a kid, was growing up with my, my brother, and suddenly an old lady showed up at the airport and they didn't tell me anything. They just said, hey, here's your grandmother. <laughs> okay, I accepted that. But the thing is, they never told me the circumstances of what happened from 1923 to 1966. We have so many dark secrets that we cannot share for my family because the immigration, the, the hatred, the paper sons, the different means to get to America, the payoffs, things of that nature. So there was, you could say a culture of shame that was ingrained and Grant would know that, but not share the stories because in this particular story, I did not know, they did not tell me about it. It took me years later looking through my grandfather's Chinese immigration file and my grandmother's uh, immigration file. And I was stunned when I realized that the separation, that their long lost love of 43 years. He never told me about it. It was simple as that when I realized the, the circumstances of the separation. Um, and, go ahead, Lisa. Well, I was just gonna say, Douglas put it in the, in the chat. The Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 is probably what opened the door. Yes, the 1965 um, by Lyndon Baines Johnson, but that was premised with the, all the, the Civil Rights Acts, all, all the movement at that time that helped pull that act together because the, the, even, even though after the Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed in 1943, only a hundred Chinese were allowed per year. Right. Yeah, so extreme limits. Of that uh, um, legacy, that, that, that discrimination. There, there were some Chinese after the war who were able to war go back and get married. The war brides, as you, could, you said, but they generally had to be, um, have, have served in the armed forces or um, became naturalized citizens. And that was hard because you couldn't, Chinese couldn't naturalize until 43. So it took a while right. to get the papers to, to, so they could naturalize. Um, and so your grandfather probably didn't fall into those categories. And so it probably took a long time to get, get paperwork. And, Actually, uh, um, my grandfather, through my far lobby, Congress member, George Brown, mm. he actually uh, in intervened to help us. Okay. I'm sorry, Raymond, I wasn't clear. When Did Celia Tan, when she went back to the village, was she able to find documents or oral histories? Uh, or history, but, but not documents. Oral histories? Yes. Okay, great. 
from the elders. Yes. Yeah, it's amazing how much elders are able to pass along sometimes, you know. There's one elder. Um, I met him in 2008. He, re he remembered the exact day my, my father left the village in 1932. Wow. He wrote down the family tree for me by memory in Chinese, telling all the stories. That's, an, that's just amazing. <laughs> How many years later was that? That was 70, 70 years later after he had left. And he was so happy to see me. He said, I was your father's best friend in school. That's crazy. Yeah. But the fact that he had a family tree also together. Oh, yeah, he just did it by memory. Just, he was pretty close. Mm. All right, there is one more question. Um, they, they're asking, could you say more about why your father came as a paper son, even though his father and other relatives had been in the U.S.? Yeah, that was a puzzle for me. And why did my father? grandfather bring my father as a son most likely this is my, my suspicion people were selling slots it, when he arrived back to america in 1923 the immigration official interview interview him and says oh what happened oh i got married and i got a son name so and so so he created a slot because of many desperate men trying to find ways to come to America, there were slots. You, you would pay maybe $1,000 for that slot. So most likely, <laughs> my grandfather saw that slot, my father. So he saw the slot. But somehow, years later, an a uncle generally gave his slot uh, of his son to my, for my father. And he came as his paper son. Yeah. At least you know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Some people came and you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. So he is he assumed to be the paper son of Kwong Hong Chung, who was a cook in Boston Chinatown. So, but he was a close cousin or uncle or relative. He didn't ask for any money. He just gave it to us. He's very generous. Very, very generous. Yeah, that's great. There's no more questions um, unless someone else has something they want to ask. I'm going to show folks a couple of Dutch books. One is, this is Raymond's book. One of Raymond's books, Chop Suey and Sushi from Sea to Shining Sea. It's a story of both Japanese and Chinese restaurants uh, throughout the country really interesting uh, collection of authors. Um, I put a link to Gordon Chong's book, um, Ghosts of Gold Mountain in here. It's really, reads really well and, and it's a great read for learning about railroad history. And then a more academic one is The Chinese and the Iron Road by, um, edited by Gordon as well as Shelley Fisher Fishkin. And it's, it's got some really interesting articles. One of them, it lists all the railroads that Chinese worked on after the transcontinental. So there's, I'd say maybe 50 or more. And I'm finding more research about Chinese who died. It's really hard. There's no records kept for the transcontinental estimates of thousands of people who died. And But I'm finding, for example, in Oregon, the Cascades Railroad, there were quite a few Chinese listed in the Portland record right. of deaths, and it, they are listed as having died in explosions, uh, building tunnels, or even being run over by railroad cars, which is <laughs> really, really, really sad. So I'll, I'll be talking about that in uh, Sacramento. And there's a, a children's um, book called Mocha Heroes, Chinese Railroad Workers, which is from the Museum of Chinese in America in New York. And it's like uh, a lot of activities and things for kids to do. So they're really good. And looks like, oh, someone wants to know, are there Chinese bakeries in your research, Raymond? Chinese bakery? No, I, I do have my favorite bakeries. A little awesome. <laughs> um, the, the one that's most famous from my childhood is Phoenix Bakery in Central Plaza in Los Angeles, Chinatown um, by the Chan family. It's still in business. 
and it, they started back in what, 1930 or so, but no, no particular stories about bakeries. But the one that comes to mind is the Phoenix Bakery in Los Angeles, Chinatown. Okay, great. And then oh, I forgot one more. There's this fantastic publication put out by the 1882 Foundation, and I bet Phil Sexton had something to do with it, but it's fantastic. If you want to go see the actual sites where Chinese built uh, Bluer Cut, um, you know, uh, Summit Tunnel, the China Wall. I was lucky to take a tour several years ago, and you can actually go to the location that the Chinese built. You can see where they might have camped on the ground. And um, the link I put in the chat with nothing describing it, third up from the bottom, is a, is a link directly to a PDF where you can download this document. And uh, I highly recommend it because there's nothing like actually being at the site where um, Raymond's great-great-grandfather worked and many, many thousands of others. So um, Phil said he's working on some tours coming up. So keep your eyes open. And uh, there's a really good article in the Smithsonian about pres preserving Summit Tunnel, which is really um, an important cause. And looks like Phil put in a link about a YouTube video about the Summit Tunnel. So everyone be sure to, to check those out. And we won't, we won't log off right away so you can copy all these links. Yeah, and I also- I'll just stay in the chat. Yeah. By going to those three dots at the bottom of the chat, yeah. you can okay. save it. Okay, go ahead, Raymond. Yeah, also, um, thanks for that. This, this book, Forever Struggle, Activism, Identity, Survivor in Boston, Chinatown, 1880 to 2018 by Michael Liu. I'm gonna buy that book and see what stories might be tell about the, the, the Tong Wars between the Along Tong and the Hip Sun Tong back in the early 20th century. So there might be some, some stories related to my uh, great grandfather in Boston, Chinatown. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, uh, El. Okay, anything else? Anyone have any other questions? Okay, Raymond gave out his, uh, his email and, and other uh, social media links online. So if you missed that, um, put a question in the chat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, okay, but thank you all for coming and be sure to uh, check out our program next week and the week after. And I hope to see you soon. Take care, everybody. Bye.